Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Philip's in the Hills, a community that is gathered in love, transformed by grace, and sent to serve. We're so glad to have you with us for worship this morning. And before we begin, I just wanted to share with you a few announcements about upcoming events in the life of our community. Uh, our normal midweek offerings continue as usual this week. We have morning prayer every morning at 8.30 a.m. on our Facebook page, as well as a midday Eucharist service at 12.15, again on our Facebook. Um, we have a Tuesday morning Bible study where we look together at the upcoming week's lectionary texts and a Thursday morning study. Um, both of these are at 10 a.m. This Thursday, the study will be a one-off session led by Father Mark on the O Antiphons, uh, perhaps better known as the verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Um, it's going to be an exciting opportunity to hear from him about the historical origins of these beautiful texts and how they can shape our own spiritual lives today. And um, after that, we're at Advent 4, and then it's Christmas. So next week, Sunday, will be at the normal time, and then Christmas Eve, we will have two services, a 3 p.m. and a 5 p.m. service. The 3 p.m. will be our children's pageant, um, and then the 5 p.m. will be our more traditional uh, Christmas Eve service. We hope that you will join us and watch one or both of those services. We'll have a service of Eucharist uh, on Christmas morning, and then uh, things get a little bit different for a while. So for the 12 days of Christmas, our normal weekday schedule will be uh, suspended. The only services that are going to be happening during the 12 days of Christmas are midday Eucharists for the feasts of, um, for four major feasts that come right after Christmas. So the Feast of St. Stephen on the 26th, and then the Feast of St. John, the Holy Innocents, and St. Thomas Becket. So those will all have uh, 1215 Eucharists on our Facebook Live, and you can watch those on the 26th, 28th, 29th, and 30th of December. Otherwise, our normal midweek programming uh, will be taking a break for the 12 days of Christmas, but we are going to be offering uh, home Eucharistic visits during the 12 days of Christmas. So the clergy of St. Philip's are going to be available to bring the Eucharist, um, to individuals during those days as we celebrate the Incarnation of our Lord, and you can sign up for that through December 20th. So the link to sign up for those visits is found in our Bell and Tower e-news, and if you haven't signed up for the Bell and Tower, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, finally, I wanted to note that we're coming up on the end of the year and um, stewardship season continues. So if St. Philip's as a community has meant something to you, um, if this is a community you consider yourself a part of, I ask you to consider how you might be able to support our ministry financially in 2021. And if you intend to do so, to please fill out a pledge form. Um, this helps us plan our budget for the upcoming year to be good stewards, to be responsible, and to continue serving the world around us. Oh, come, oh, come, thou Lord of might, who to thy tribes on Sinai's height in ancient times didst give the law, in cloud and majesty and awe, rejoice, Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength 
of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from the thrones and has lifted up the lowly. Filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy. The promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Reading from the first letter of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophet, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Here ends the reading. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy this was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies. Free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. To give his people knowledge of salvation. By the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. To shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of Glory to the Father and to the Son.
Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews and pr sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. After these many months of praying the morning office on Sundays rather than the Eucharistic rite, I have to admit that I miss saying the Nicene Creed together. At morning prayer, of course, we say instead the Apostles' Creed. And as I'm sure you'll know, there are differences between the two. One of the most striking differences uh, comes at the very end of each creed. There are obviously similarities uh, in the uh, conclusion of each but a striking difference. I wonder if you recall the final affirmation of the Apostles' Creed. How does it go? I'll wait here a moment across this phone as I record uh, this sermon uh, to see if you can remember it where you are, if it's not already memorized. Well, it ends, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. How then does the Nicene Creed end? In Rite 1 of the Liturgy of the Holy Eucharist, we say either, depending on which of the two options you choose, either I or we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And there you have it, the difference. Not I believe, but I look for. Here we find such a striking change in the key words of each affirmation of the Nicene Creed up to this point. The foundational words in which every single affirmation uh, has been, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. But here in the affirmation that concludes the Nicene Creed, and without which our faith would be in vain, as Blessed Paul the Apostle says, we affirm something different. Not I believe, but I look for. We look for. Which is to say, I anticipate, I expect, I long to see, I await, I love the appearing of. 
I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And there the creed concludes. I miss affirming these words with you, Sunday after Sunday, genuinely, truly. Their inclusion, these words in the Nicene Creed, embraces, binds into one strand every other affirmation of Christian faith and hope. On this third Sunday of Advent, my goodness, third Sunday, here we were just two weeks ago on the first, but on this third Sunday of Advent in particular, this last creedal affirmation is even more striking to me because on this Sunday, as Father Robert mentioned uh, in his sermon on the first Sunday of Advent, we focus on four themes throughout the season of Advent. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And so on this third uh, of four uh, Advent Sundays, we focus on the theological theme uh, of heaven. The third, again, of four themes inherent to our journey through this season. I look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. This is an affirmation of ultimate concern. It is an affirmation of affirmations. It addresses what is most crucial for you and I, of what is to come. When we, like all flesh, go down to the grave, when we cross the threshold to life eternal and stand before the one who judges both the quick and the dead, what will come in that fleeting second from this life to the next? Christians look the life of the world to come. We look to it. And this has something fundamentally to do with our belief, as we discuss and consider here on this uh, third Sunday of Advent, our belief in heaven and our expectant joy. For the season of Advent, if it is anything, is a season of great anticipation. So we talk about faith and belief. I believe. And here in this last affirmation, we look for, I look for, the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. It is true that we, in all manner of things, have faith. We believe in all manner of things. I believe this apple will bop me on the head should it fall from the tree under which I sit. I have maybe, as some folks may believe, I have faith that oblivion awaits me should I sail past the edge of the earth. Maybe some people still believe that, I don't know. I believe because I have tried this, that it will be more difficult to pull on my trousers if I have first put on my shoes. Great challenge there, I assure you. The point though certainly is that we understand and experience faith and belief in different ways. That goes without saying, but worth saying, maybe. To believe and have faith in the fact of gravity, or that the world is not flat, but indeed globular, and in the challenge of fitting a square peg through a round hole, none of this says anything at all about my interior disposition towards these incontrovertible realities. Faith and belief in this instance, with all of these examples and others still, they say nothing about whether or not they maybe bring me joy or sadness. Maybe I'm ambivalent towards these immutable facts and laws of nature. But here we are with the creed. When I say not simply that I believe, but I expect, I look for, when I set forth my beliefs one by one and admit that I long for, that I await them, something is transformed in that moment. I begin to show how that which I believe, as I anticipate and await it expectantly, how that utterly shapes me. It defines me, it permeates my inmost self, it makes me who I am. I await it. And when it arrives by God, by its approach, I will be happy. 
I believe and therefore I look for that in which I believe. I await with faith perhaps what I look for and long for with expectancy because its approach is the fulfillment of my desire, of faith desire. I think a curious question, at least as I've considered these last few days and throughout Advent, is how can I long for that which I do not already know? How can I long for that which I do not already know? If my knowledge of it is only in part, how am I assured that what I await will bring me felicity, will bring me joy and great gladness? How can I anticipate its arrival with joy, assume from the get-go that it will bring me happiness if I do not know it somehow in part already? And here, and I love an Orthodox theologian I'd love to quote from him. He says that this is Christianity's uniqueness. This is Christianity's greatest joy. He writes, Christian faith is not an affirmation of some abstract intellectual truth. No, above all, it is an encounter with the one whom it affirms, and therefore it is knowledge and vision within the soul, a penetration into the heart. I think what he's saying, at least as I try to interpret the profundity of a statement like that, is that our knowledge of God, our knowledge of God, our faith and our belief, is not that which comes by words about God. Lest we speak about God and think that we gain control over God. But our knowledge and love of God comes from indeed just that, love and relationship with God. Knowledge of God comes by love and relationship, by knowing God, by knowing the one we know, and more crucially, the one by whom we have been known, are known, and have been changed, and are changed. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 17 and following. For those who are in Christ Jesus, what does he say? My goodness, I'm sitting here thinking, and I suddenly, I don't have it written down. Uh, they have been made new. There is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Behold, we no longer regard any of us from a human point of view. Because what has been is no longer now. It is made new in Christ and in relationship with him. And so thinking about the creed, about this sense of belief and faith, and indeed more than that, still anticipation, of expectation, we look for the resurrection of the dead and await with expectancy the life of the world to come because how do we know it and expect it and desire it? It is because we have in some small part, if only at the best, most pure and exalted moments of contemplation and prayer, when we suddenly discover our hearts in a flash of clarity, despite our own actions, but it done to us. Overcome by the true light and mystery of God's love for us, God's resurrected life that death cannot destroy. And that life has given new life to our mortal bodies also through his indwelling spirit. We know by faith that we are made for eternity. We know it somehow. That life does not end, but changes. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world, uh, the life of the world to come. What a curious thing to say, that we know utterly, even though that which we affirm and know and await and expect is rational and empirically preposterous. Where is the litmus test? It is unprovable, it is inexplicable, yet undeniable, it is self-evident. That God's victory over death is the beginning of our victory. How can it be? And this shapes our vision and hope for the world and for ourselves, for our neighbors, and even for our enemies. I wonder, is it strange to believe with expectancy, to look for
for and hope for that Christ was raised from the dead without a litmus test to prove it? Is it crazy? Is it strange? Is it strange to know by faith that he has made our death, in fact, a path past the threshold of this life into the life which is to come? As best we can to know, what does that even mean? But to find in the depths of the heart the hope and the anticipation of something which cannot be proved. Is it strange to believe in heaven? As we consider on this third Sunday of Advent, is it strange to await heaven's approach? I think at the end of the day, thinking about my own experience of daily life and faith and belief as difficult and as joyous and wondrous as it is from time to time, life goes on, doesn't it? Life goes on. We know that every day brings its own sorrows and joys, its own hardships, its own triumphs. We fall, we get up, we fall again. And the cares and occupations of this life so often bewilder, they beleaguer our hope, our sense of anticipation for the mystery of God's love. How long, O oh Lord, how long will we wait for you to act? I wonder if you, like me, wonder this, is it okay to admit that we so often forget God and the world around us forget, maybe feel blind to God? The tide of life's many burdens carry us away. It's true. But with faith, somehow, beyond hope, by faith, we cannot now wholly forget that we are ever walking in God's sight. Come what may, because we have, if now only in part, within some small corner of our souls, we have experienced it, we have tasted it, hope, faith. We know here and now in ourselves in others, in the world, that God is for us and not against us. We have heard a voice within us forever calling us homeward, as someone wrote. We have heard the voice of God calling us back to God. And so against all odds, we wait, we expect, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We look for heaven because we have known it here in the depths of our hearts and in our relationships with others. We have seen the world transfigured by God's love. I thought about all of this not only simply in terms of that theological theme which we consider on this third Sunday of Advent, but because of the Advent journey itself through these four weeks as we now here approach with great haste the coming of our Lord in the manger. With this self-same longing for heaven, that which is inexplicable yet undeniable, with this longing, with this anticipation, with this love of God, with hope for the appearing of God, we hope for the life of the world to come. And we pray exactly that, don't we, in the words that our Lord taught us, that God's life, God's will would come among us, that that which is in heaven will be done here on earth, that the love of God be born here among and within us, in each of our hearts. We look for, we await the coming of our Lord. He will not tarry. He will not tarry long. Advent is, as we began to say, it is, if it is anything, a season of great anticipation, of longing, of joy, of humility and penitence, a hope beyond the appearance of things, a hope which does not die. It is immortal. It is born and conquers death. Beloved, the time is close. The time is at hand. 
This is the third Sunday of Advent, Gaudet Sunday, a word taken from the word rejoice. Rejoice, beloved. The time of God's coming, God's appearing is at hand. And nothing will stop it. Even our feelings of bewilderment to see in life as all of the cares and occupations choke out our sense of hope from day to day. We are asked now on this occasion, this Sunday, to rejoice, to sing with joy for our King and our Savior draweth nigh. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel, I love that, wonderful. O come, O wisdom from on high, who ordered all things mightily. To us the path of knowledge show and teach us in its ways to go. O come, O come, great Lord of might, who to your tribes on Sinai's height in ancient times did give the law in cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice. O come, O branch of Jesse's stem, unto your own and rescue them. From depths of hell your people save and give them victory over the grave. Rejoice. O come, O key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe for us the heavenward road and bar the way to death's abode. Rejoice. O come, O bright and morning star, and bring us comfort from afar. Dispel the shadows of the night and turn our darkness into light. Rejoice. O come, O king of nations, bind in one the hearts of all humanity. Bid all our sad divisions cease and be yourself our king of peace. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to you. Amen.
Today we celebrate the baptism of Rhonda Ruby to get to celebrate this occasion with you in the sacrament of rebirth. The candidate for holy baptism will now be presented. I present Rhonda Ruby to receive the sacrament of baptism. Do you desire to be baptized? I do. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. Will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support this person and her life in Christ? Amen. Let us join with the person who is committing herself to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the Apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I am willing with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbors as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people, and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. Let us now pray for this person who is to receive the sacrament of new birth. Deliver her, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Open her heart to your grace and truth. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Fill her with your holy and life-giving spirit. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Keep her in the faith and communion of your holy church. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach her to love others in the power of the Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send her into the world and witness to your love. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring her to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant, O oh Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection, and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks in our place. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. 
over the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through he led the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt to the land of promise. And in it, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you. Sanctify this water, we pray you. Sanctify this water, we pray you. By the power of the Holy Spirit. That she who here is cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Spirit in Christ's own work. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon this your servant the forgiveness of sins and have raised her to the new life of grace. Sustain her, O Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Give her an inquiring and a discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, the spirit to know and to love you with the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Let us walk and be baptized. We receive you into the household of God, confess the faith of Christ crucified, Proclaim his resurrection and share with us in his eternal priesthood. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All praise and thanks to you, most merciful Father, for adopting us as your own children, for incorporating us into your holy church, and for making us worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.